Okay, welcome everybody to today's Heidelberg Joint Astronomy Colloquium. We have as our speaker and guest today Roberto Battiston, who um, was born in Trento, which will become important toward the end of my introduction. Uh, he did his uh, laureato de in Physica, uh, which I think is sort of like masters, uh, I, would, yep. I would say, um, in, in Pisa, 1979, and then did his PhD in, uh, in Orsay in 1982, and then he became, in 1995, a, a professor in Perugia, if I'm not mistaken, and then since um, very recently, about a year ago, he moved back to um, uh, to his, his town where he was born, in Trento, and he is the um, uh, spokesman of the AMS, deputy, eh? deputy. Deputy, deputy spokesman of AMS uh, for for, it, for Italy, and uh, he is also in since 90, in, in 2009 became the, the president of the Commissione Scientifica Nazionale del INFN. I think that's sort of the the Nuclear Physics uh, Society of of, it, of Italy, and so. He, and he has published over 400 publications. So today he is going to talk about uh, experiments on the International Space Station uh, uh, on the Alpha Magnetic spectro Spectrometer. And of course, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Let's welcome him to Heidelberg. Okay. Working, yes. So thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here today in this very prestigious university in this very nice town. Uh, I will talk about <clears throat> an experiment which is located on the International Space Station. You can see it, uh, a picture taken along the main truss of the International Space Station. This facility is large like a football uh, field, so it's a very large one, and uh, can host uh, uh, astronauts, six of them are permanently there, but also experimentation in various fields. In particular, this experiment is working about uh, cosmic rays, precision measuring cosmic rays. Cosmic rays were found, uh, discovered 100 years ago by an Austrian physicist, Victor Hess, using hot air balloons. So very simple-minded technology at that time. But since then, in the century which passed, it has been uh, studied as a, a very incredible phenomenon extending over about uh, 32 order of magnitude, uh, just uh, uh, from uh, uh, galactic cosmic rays down to the highest energy one in, in flux uh, and about uh, uh, 12 order of magnitude in energy. So you can see if you have a phenomenon like that, which extends so much in intensity and, and uh, uh, energy, there is not one single technique to study them. There are many techniques which exploit the most incredible uh, ways uh, but uh, what we're discussing today is direct measurement, which can be performed from space uh, in the energy range from one GV to a few TV. So this is the scale of energy, absolutely non-thermal energies where particles are accelerated by some phenomena and reach out from either the galaxy or outside the galaxy to the Earth. The beam which is uh, being studied in cosmic rays is a dirty beam. It's a beam given by nature. We cannot do anything about it. It's a mixture of different particles, proton, all of them have to be stable or stable enough to survive a few million years. Uh, proton, electron, positron, antiproton, deuterium, all the nuclei, some of the isotopes which are stable enough, uh, mix it together in uh, ratios which sometimes are 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So if you want to measure precisely, you have to separate particle by particle and changing with the energy. You have to separate particle by particle precisely enough to tell this is an antiproton from this is an electron. Why you want to do that? We will come to that in, uh, in during the talk. But if you do precisely measurement, the most ex rare particles, antiproton, positrons, deuterium, anti-deuterium, if you find that, maybe anti-helium, if we are able to find it eventually, uh, you can say something very important about the origin of those particles. And this is bring us to the issue of fundamental physics, new phenomena which are interesting to study. So I mentioned that uh, cosmic ray is a 
something which has been studied for the last 100 years. At the beginning of the last century, they gave birth to particle physics, then accelerator took over, but uh, is interested to understand how they are studied today. This plot show acceptance in square meter star radiant versus lifetime in second. So let's start with the lifetime. Uh, this is one day, this is one month, this is one year, these are 10 years. Uh, you see a, a bunch of experiments. The blue one are spectrometers measuring the sign of the charges. The red one are calorimeter measuring the energy. And you can see there is a bunch of experiment from fairly small one, less than 10 to the minus two square meters per radiant, up to order of one square meters per radiant, all of them operating for more or less one day, one week, a couple of weeks. These are the balloons, stratospheric balloons filled of helium, which have uh, operated uh, over the last 40 years to study cosmic rays from uh, various locations, including the South Pole, where they were able to operate uh, on circular winds for a few weeks. Then there is a gap, and then you go to 10 to the 8 or more. This is the exposure of satellites, which can go over for years or few years or several years. Again, you can have a small experiment, medium experiment, large experiment. And in space, you find out that spectrometers, we have only two. One very small one called Pamela, and one large one called AMS. And several calorimeters, typically for gamma ray physics or X, hard X-ray physics or or, or sometimes also cosmic ray physics like cos B. And, and this is the situation today. More and more experiments are pl planned in the next few years to operate in space because of the advantage in, a, in lifetime is so, is so, is so important. Uh, AMS is a TV, a spect a precision spectrometer. It's being built exactly in the same way the experiment at CERN are built. You have a magnet which bend the particles in a tracker measuring the bending radius and the sign of the charge. You have uh, uh, other detectors which are used to identify the particle. For instance, a transition radiation detector measuring electron and positron, again, proton and other particles. You have uh, a time of light which tells the velocity to a certain interval in energy and the trigger of the experiment. You have a ring imaging charge on detector which count the particle measuring the velocity and the charge, the absolute value of the charge. And then you finally have on the bottom a calorimeter measuring the energy of the particle. So all these together tell you unambiguously to the level of 10 to the minus 6 what is an electron, a positron, a proton, an antiproton, and so on. The scale of this object is 8.5 tons, which is large for space, is small if you compare to CERN. In space, this experiment is sometimes called the Hubble Space Telescope of, of charged particles because of the size and the complexity. It has 300,000 channels and, and uh, 2.5 kilowatt of power. AMS, the international collaboration, is built like the experiment uh, at CERN. So it, it, it encompasses 16 countries, 60 institutes, and 600 physicists during the peak of the construction phase. It's built by the scientists. It's, it's not given to industry to be built as sometime space experiment. Most of the time, space experiments are done. They're built within the facilities in laboratories like mine and many other laboratories, which are really putting together testing and qualifying the hardware to build this experiment together. It's a DOE-sponsored experiment. NASA gave us two flights, thank you, to the agreement with DOE, but 95% of the construction has been done in Europe and mostly in uh, Europe and Asia, and mostly in Europe, because of tradition at CERN and other laboratories in Germany and Italy. Uh, so I mentioned about the accuracy in identifying rare particles. Example, we'll come to that several times today, identifying positrons against protons. We want to do it with the reliability of 10 to the 6, one in a million. How you do that? You have a, a transition radiation detector identifying particles which are high gamma, highly relativistic, uh, using the X-ray emission. And this gives you at least 10 to the 2 in rejection against the proton, which is the most abundant uh, uh, background. Then you have a calorimeter, where you have uh, a, a electromagnetic shower development. And you can have a rejection of at least 10 to the 4. You combine the 2, you get 10 to the 6. This is important because the positrons may be the signal for new particles like dark matter or for new phenomena. So you will see that uh, is a, a, a essential part of our science observation and is based on the capability. We can tell this is a positron unambiguously. Uh, operating on the space station for uh, astrophysics uh, 
uh, astroparticle type of experiment is somewhat different than, uh, it's not usual. There are very few examples like that. Typically, observatories are sent as a standalone satellite uh, deep in, in space or on orbit. They can be tuned and aligned, sometimes in the Lagrangian points, uh, and they can control their own exposure to the sun. Space station bring us, uh, according to its uh, orientation, around orbits and seasons around the Earth. So we do have a, a severe issue of verifying the thermal behavior of this experiment uh, using thousands of thermal measurements and uh, uh, techniques to cope with the continued changing thermal environment up there. Up there means we have uh, the deep space at a few Kelvin, the albedo of the Earth at, three, at about 300 Kelvin, and the sun at about 5.5 kilo Kelvin, which are continuously changing, including the reflections of the space station. This is an example. Sometimes the panels, the solar panels come in front of us, they can stop in front of us, and suddenly from a certain environment, you go to a completely different environment. It can stay like that for minutes, hours, sometimes even days. So these are the, 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 the reasons why we are operating 24 hours a day, checking uh, both with an automatic method, sometimes with a manual one, that everything is uh, stable from the point of view of temperature. So let's go quickly through the instrumentation. The magnet is a permanent magnet, which has an intensity as a dipole of 1.5 kilogauss. It's built out of 4,000 pieces, which are magnetized independently, organized in what is called ALBA array, so that the field is strong inside the cylinder, basically zero to first approximation outside the cylinder, and minimizing the dipole uh, effect uh, on, 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 this, on the interaction with the magnetic field of the Earth. This magnet has been built long ago, has been built for the first flight of AMS in 1998, has been uh, built in China, and there are various tests which have been done there, like accelerating to 17.7 G in this facility, vibrating uh, and, and checking the performance uh, again in CALT in Beijing. We built seven magnets, uh, and three of them were uh, uh, put to destruction following the specification by NASA to check that everything would stand a prolonged ext uh, and extended the operation in, on the space station. After 12 years and after one flight in 1998 for, for 12 days, the stability of the magnetic field has been measured to be better, better than 1% over the entire area and volume of the magnet. So it's really a stable permanent magnet. Um, then from top to bottom, a quick flash on the various detector. This is a transition radiation detector. has been built by a very strong and competent German group uh, directed with Professor Scheele and Rubens Meyer in Aachen, which is a 22 layer of uh, uh, flitch inter interspersed with the detector uh, straw tubes, uh, which measure the X-ray. This repeated measurement according to uh, the emission uh, of uh, transition radiation allow us to have a very reliable measurement of the uh, relativistic behavior of the particle. These are the data from ISS. Over a range of 1 GeV to 1 TeV, the proton rejection at 90% efficiency for positrons, as you can see, exceed 10 to the 2. Uh, it gets up to 10 to the 4 for a certain interval. It goes down at close to 2 TeV be below 10 to the 2. It still is about 10 at 1 TeV, and depending on the efficiency, you can reduce the cut a little bit. It can go up to 50 or 60. The reason why it's falling down is very simple. At this high energy proton, we have a very high gamma and emit X-rays similarly like electrons. They become relativistic, and you cannot do anything against that. Uh, we go down to the time of flight. This has been built in Italy. Uh, it has a very good accuracy in the timing. Uh, this as a function, the charge can be 80 picosecond or 50 picosecond. And thanks to a careful calibration, these are the measurement of the different ions you can find in space. The abundance is a typical abundance of galactic cosmic rays. And the interesting thing, you can measure the sand detector, helia, and zinc. And the entries is few 10 to the 9 to 1. So there is a different a billion in the intensity of the various particles. So this is an, a demonstration of how precisely this device is calibrated. Then we have the silicon tracker, which has been uh, built uh, under the leadership of the Italian team. It's nine layers of precise silicon tracker. Each layer has about 8.5 microns of accuracy. 
and you measure the bending of the particle up to the highest energy. We have a maximum detectable rigidity, which is the, the energy at which you have 100% error. It be become uh, useless of 2 t. Sorry about that. Uh, um, uh, at 2 TV, which is a fairly large energy. This is the team uh, in, of Italian colleagues which have been built, building the tracker in Perugia. They are, by chance, uh, wearing the Italian flag. Um, there are the different planes during the construction. This is the insertion of the tracker inside the magnetic bore. And in order to control uh, the stability, dimensional stability of this uh, tracker, a very special cooling system has been developed in collaboration with China. It's based on CO2 two-phase gas liquid pump, which is isothermally extracting the energy that the tracker is emitting uh, 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 and putting this energy to the, to the radiators down to space. And this is very important because uh, thanks to the calibration using cosmic rays, uh, we can show that the stability of this tracker over this two cubic meter of the volume is, is uh, covered is within two micron, two to three micron over a period of 18 months. So this device is extremely stable so we can make use of its accuracy in order to measure the uh, um, momentum and the sign of the charge of the particles. We go down to the ring imaging. I have to stop that, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, okay. Um, the ring imaging charge counter, which is uh, uh, based on 11,000 photon sensors collecting the Cherenkov light emitted by particles. Particles, they, when they go through a radiator, they emit a cone of, uh, of uh, light. And in space, it's really just beautiful because you can tell a charge from another one just counting the photons which are in the, in the, in the, in the cone. So these are particles measuring the space. We have a, a neon at 0.57 TV. We have an aluminum at 9 TV over C. And uh, you can tell the charge are counting those photons. Uh, and at a lower energy, by measuring the radius of this, uh, of this ring, uh, you can measure the velocity. So it's a very powerful detector because particle by particle, it can tell you a lot of information simply measuring the ring imaging uh, of the Cherenkov emission. Then at the very bottom, we have a calorimeter, which is made out of 50,000 fibers mounted together with 600 kilograms of lead, precisely located and read out at the extreme by photomultipliers, has a 17 radiation length of thickness, which is a, a very thick amount of material, so to allow precise measurement of uh, electron, positron, and light rays up to one TV. Uh, this has been built uh, in Italy in collaboration with France and China. And uh, this is the beautiful result of the performance it has a typical one over screw of E resolution, which is 10% over screw of E in GV and a constant term of 1.4%, meaning above 100 GV, basically the constant term is getting down to a couple of percent, asymptotically to 1%. This will become very important in the following analysis because never before uh, such a precision calorimeter has been put in space to measure cosmic rays. And these are the data from the ISS uh, on the capability of rejecting protons or, or hadrons uh, using the ECAL. You can see that above uh, one, two GV is 10 to the four. It remains to 10 to the four up to about a uh, few hundred GV, and then it's still more than 10 to the three at one TV. So it's an ideal detector for measuring high energy uh, uh, electromagnetic particles in space. Uh, for this experiment, we meant we have 300,000 channels, so we have to develop a lot of electronics ourselves. We had to take families of inter the circuit, operate to space qualification standard through exposure to test beams. And at the end, we design our, memor our various boards ourselves, and, and totally are 350 boards, 600 microcomputers, all kind of uh, memories, uh, interfaces, computers, which have been built starting from commercial electronics upgraded to space standards. This was a, a very important part of our activity. And to do that, we did use uh, accelerators uh, of various uh, types uh, in different countries. 
And the thing which we did, uh, we did expose uh, uh, to various kinds of space qualification within the team. This is in particular in my laboratory in Perugia. We had a thermovacuum test, uh, which in 2009, we had about uh, uh, 9,000 hours of testing of different components. All the electronics, all the detectors were coming there to be tested in vacuum condition, in thermovacuum condition before being integrated. And this is, uh, again, the same laboratory, the testing for vibration of the magnet structure to verify the nonlinear behavior. This took about four months in close co collaboration with NASA. And this is a test done in Abege in, in Germany. It's a static test of a model of AMS supported, uh, uh, submitted to, to stresses and, and, and pressions to verify that uh, under launch condition, nothing was breaking or deforming. And of course, we had a tremendous support by CERN. The detector were built the detector subsystems were built in different countries, but then were brought to CERN, they were integrated there, and most important, they were exposed to the CERN beams, uh, which are uh, the highest available in the world. Here is interesting to note that highest available in the world is not really high if you compare with what we are going to measure in space. The highest beam are typically proton at 400 GV. I mentioned to you we are typically going above one TV. So the performance of this detector can only be tested to a certain level using beam on Earth. Those beams are designed to match the LAC, typical energy of secondary particles which are built in, in, the, in the collisions. They are not matching the typical energy you can find with this size of detector in space, but still are very useful. So on May 16, 2011, it was launched, eight minutes to go to space, three days to catch the space station rotating in the same orbit, and eventually uh, about eight hours of careful extraction from the shuttle bay area, transport from one Canadian arm to the second Canadian arm, moving slightly, slowly to the positioning, and then click, connecting mechanically, connecting electrically, and installing it. Four hours after the installation, we got the first cosmic ray measurement, and since then, is now about three years, two and a half years, we are taking data. This is the space station today. So if you go there, on the skyline, you will see this experiment uh, operating there, and this is a picture which has been taken, obviously, by astronaut, either approaching the station or going away. away. And, uh, we have not, uh, we, are, we are taking data day and night without interruption, with uh, basically no support by the astronaut. Is everything automatic going to, the, to ground? And we are operating at CERN a payload operation control where 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we take the data through this network of, inter, of communication. And this laboratory, this, uh, pay, this center is connected uh, on the international network uh, which is operating the space station. So people here are really in the loop on the space station uh, 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 center in Houston. When uh, the famous one uh, used to we got a problem, yeah, you got this kind of information through the loops. And this is connected to the United States through a series of uh, protected connections certified by NASA so we can operate that uh, op at, from CERN. So, we are here to discuss about the physical results. Uh, taking data in low Earth orbit for charged particles, not for photons, means uh, that you are exposed to the geomagnetic cutoff, which is varying with the orbit. So it means uh, we have an exposure time of about 50 million seconds after two years of operation, which, however, depend on energy. A lower energy, they get a cutoff most of the time. Above about 25 GV, you don't have the cutoff anymore. Of course, we still have much more data here because our exponential going down. So altogether, most of the statistics is the low energy, but uh, the lifetime, the efficiency in getting those data is, of course, limited by the geomagnetic field, which is limiting the flux. Uh, we are uh, the only spectrometer operating in space of this category, and we are... Uh, uh, probably operating there for quite some time before anybody can check, if ever, our result. So we decided to put together two groups to do an independent analysis. So to avoid to have uh, something published which is uh, incorrect to the best of our knowledge. So we have uh, 
after a long discussion with the fine group A and alpha, not to make any, any privilege. And these people work independently and they compare the result only at the final part of the, of the analysis from the raw data up to the final plot. And this is ex extremely important to have a reliability, a reli reliable analysis uh, uh, for the publication. Uh, this summer we published a number of papers. Uh, this one is uh, really published uh, in physical letter. The other one are presented as a uh, preprint for the ICRC, which are covering many, but not all, of the spectral information that are important for this field. I will spend quite a lot of time on discussing this one because this is a, 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 a one distribution which uh, has a special feature. Um, this plot uh, uh, is uh, in our field uh, uh, very frequently used. This was uh, uh, the initial ideas that if there are, that dark matter is about uh, six times more abundant than matter. We don't know what it's about. From our point of view, dark matter is made out of particles. From astrophysics' point of view, maybe something else. But we are looking for particles. And uh, before the LAC era, supersymmetries were the, uh, the, the very much popular as a candidate to provide a supersymmetric particle, the lightest one to be neutral, neutralino, and to be the responsible for the existence of dark matter. Neutralino are filled in the universe according to this picture uh, because they cannot decay. They can annihilate, however, and their annihilation can create normal particles like positrons, antiprotons, maybe sometime anti-deuterium. Uh, so by looking to the number of positrons as a function of the energy, you may expect features against the standard uh, decreasing ratio positrons to electrons, which you do expect uh, with normal cosmic ray behavior. So about uh, five years ago, six years ago, this was uh, very much studied and uh, in, uh, nine, in 2009, 2008, Pamela, the smaller spectrometer, has measured this ratio indeed to increase uh, above 10 GV up to 100 GV by a significant amount. So there was uh, hundreds of papers uh, which were uh, studying this effect, uh, 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 trying to interpret it as uh, dark matter-induced phenomena. What happened since uh, the LAC has uh, taken data, has uh, discovered the Higgs, uh, but uh, most important, has made uh, 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 excluded uh, supersymmetries uh, in a fairly large amount of the phase space available for the parameters. So this is not necessarily the only possibility to explain this uh, ratio, and I will discuss about that uh, in, in, in uh. So the first thing that the community asked us to measure was exactly to measure the ratio positron to electron, to see it at higher energy, how it does behave. And uh, these are examples of electrons and positrons uh, collected in the first uh, two years. This is an electron of 982 GV. This is a positron of 636 GV. The fact I quote three digits is because at those energy, the calorimeter gives me the accuracy within 1%. So it's really within plus or minus 10 GV or so. You, know, you see our very clean events, the TRD give a signal, the time of flight, the tracker, the calorimeter is well contained within the depth because it's a thick calorimeter, so you can measure precisely the energy. Similarly for the positrons. So we have about 6.8 million of those events, about 6.2 are electrons and 0.6 are positrons. We separate electrons from protons, as I mentioned before, using estimator based on the TRD signal, and also based on the calorimeter signal. So we can really have a clean electron and positron sample. And then, beam by beam, we do this kind of distribution. We measure uh, the protons, the positrons, how they merge, and most important, the contamination of these two distributions. Because uh, the understanding of the shape of the template, defining a proton, defining a positron, is extremely important to come to understand which is the systematic error which remains once you subtract the overlapping part of the curve. 
And we want to do a measurement at the level 1% in order to be uh, giving a very precise result. One effect which is very important is the charge confusion. You don't want to measure an electron to become a positron or vice versa. And this is the charge confusion probability up from a few 20 GV up to about 300 GV. You can see that a 300 GV is still of the order of 2%. And the fluctuation of data over Monte Carlo, is, they are, which are the errors on the uncertainty, which is the systematic error, are still within 1%. So based on this kind of plot, we claim our result is precisely known to 1% on each beam. We published that on the 5th of April 2013. We got the, pub, the, the, the cover of physical UV letters, and this is the result. These are the red points. So we measure the positron fraction from 0.5 GV to 350 GV, the last bin. Here we are comparing this red point with anything else that's been published before. Forget about the one with very large error bars. Concentrate on the blue point and on the green point. The blue point are the Pamela measurement this spectrometer which uh, measured this effect in 2009, which, however, because it's a small detector, has a very sparse measurement here and eventually run, off, run out of, 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 uh, um, of statistics. And the green one is a measurement done by Fermi, the famous gamma ray detector, which by some uh, clever usage of the magnetic field of the Earth was able to have an indication also with large error bars on this ratio, also in, I mean, using their data. So let's go to the higher part of the spectrum. First of all, you can see here that the high density of those points, keep in mind that the accuracy in the energy determination is very good because of the calorimeter, rules out if anybody has ever suspected any particular feature in this interval. This is very smooth. Obviously, it's increasing, and we have good agreement with Pamela. On the very high energy, something is changing. And we do have uh, a good agreement with Pamela, a somewhat less agreement with Fermi, but Fermi is a calorimeter, so it's not exactly the comparison that is important to do. But uh, the situation becomes really interesting when you go at high energy. The slope of this ratio is decreasing by a factor of 10 from about 20 GV to about 200 GV. So is, 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 is uh, dying. This phenomenon is dying. This ratio is defined as the positron over positron plus electron, meaning theoretically it can go to 50%. But here it's flattening down to 15%. So whatever this phenomenon is, uh, is uh, losing steam and reaching asymptotic value at about 15%. And this flattening was not possible to see before. Now, uh, what is that uh, is another issue. But for the, for, for the moment, this is uh, the contribution we give to this uh, measurement. Now, to study what is coming after this point, everybody is interesting, inter interested to see what happened here up to the TV. We did, uh, one can do a very simple fit. This fit, use the positron fit as the sum of the diffuse contribution for positron, which is going down as an exponential with this exponential, a diffuse contribution of electrons, which are going down with this exponential, plus a source contribution, which explains this rise, which can be parameterized as a constant term, which goes down with this exponential, plus a, a multiplied by cutoff. So by doing this fit with those, all this data, we get a good, uh, chi-square value, and we can uh, determine the various parameters. And uh, we learn things which were known before. For the diffuse spectrum, the, the positrons are less energetic than the electrons. This is known from previous measurements, so this fit works well. For the source com contribution instead, the source spectrum is more stiff, more energetic uh, than the diffuse one, so the, the, the source as a higher uh, energy, typical higher energy behavior. The ratio of positron to, to electron is about 10% of 1 GV, which is known from previous measurement. But most important, the source term against the electron is at the level of 1%. So when we measure this rise, which is very visible, we are dealing with 1% of the statistics. And on that, we want to measure with 1% accuracy. 
So 1% to 1%, meaning we are making 10 to the minus 4 uh, a kind of uh, measurement on this kind of data. Uh, there are very few, and we are measured very precisely. This is the difficult thing that uh, we are doing. And if you take this uh, estimation of the cutoff, uh, we get uh, a cutoff energy which is estimated 760 GV with a big error, plus 1,000 minus 280. What you can get out of those curves? So people start uh, making studies about that. For instance, take uh, the neutralino uh, inspired models. Supersymmetries have been excluded, but still there are parameters that can be used, uh, that could be st still unreachable to, to, to LAC. So if you take neutralinos at the given energy, for instance 100 GV, they are expected to annihilate and decay in E plus, E minus, and all their final states. Since they are two particles, decay in two particles, they have a distinct spectrum which go exactly to the maximum energy available for the mass. So 100 GV would correspond to 100 GV with the typical shape and a quick abrupt fall down. So the, the, those theorists, Bergson et al, started to play in the game to take neutralino uh, in, uh, induced shapes and uh, uh, seeing when they could become visible in this spectrum, which does not show any feature. So they were able to extract from that a limit on a neutralino mass, assuming that this was the cause for such a behavior. And obviously, you can see that since it's still rising at 350 GV, such an analysis is putting a limit on the, on the, on the cross-section time the velocity for neutralino masses in the low energy value between 10 GV and 100 GV, which is the best than anything has been done before, because clearly these data, if are interpreted in terms of neutralino, are pushing the mass to very high value. This is quite obvious. So if you compare with the limits from Fermi, which is green, and from WMAP, we can see that this is now uh, pushing this limit in these low, relatively low energy masses very, very much at low value. Uh, you can take the fit which I presented before, which of course is fitting very nicely the data, this green curve, and just go on using the fit and changing the value of the cutoff just to see what you expect to happen if the cutoff is there at 760 GV. What if the cutoff is uh, one sigma above or one sigma below? This is the interval of possible shapes, which using this very simple uh, fitting, they, this curve could have in the future. And you can ask yourself, can we go, are we able to test that in the coming years? Uh, the answer is, is yes, to a certain extent, because uh, if you have a dark matter spire model, you do expect a quick fall down as a function of the energy. These are the Monte Carlo simulation. If you do have a super no, um, pulsar inspired model, because pulsar public, produce a lot of positron electrons, you do have a completely different behavior. So you do have a certain sensitivity in separating at least classes of models by looking to data which are being collected in the coming years. In 10 years from now, we do expect this kind of uh, statistical error, and we are expecting to separate to a certain extent, uh, looking to the shape, uh, this typical do uh, two different behaviors. But it's not enough. The, the, this, this separation has to be done much more reliably. So we are now studying the anti-proton uh, uh, signal. The anti-proton are rare, even more rare, rarer than, than positrons. And they can also be produced by a source which is uh, uh, of supersymmetric origin. And similarly, Monte Carlo simulation, as this one, they sh we show that in the coming 10 years we can separate to a certain sensitivity models which are inspired by the presence of antiproton due to dark matter from models which are not sensitive to that. The presence of a pulsar is influencing the positron part, is not influencing the, anti the, an the antiproton one. So we playing with different particles, we are going to constrain in the coming years uh, the source of this excess of positrons. I would like to call to your attention the fact that LAC is a wonderful machine, but uh, the capability of testing the neutralino masses is somewhat limited. The 
limit on the neutrino masses from the LAC is about 50 GV today. And in the coming years, will increase slowly and a little bit. Maybe we'll reach 100 GV eventually. So if the phenomenon we see has to do with supersymmetry, we, do, we are exploring a, 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 a parameter range which has nothing to do with LAC. If it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a pulsar, of course, there is no problem. But if that's to be with new particles, we are exploring very high energy, uh, which LAC cannot explore. Uh, what we can do in order to understand uh, if this uh, excess of positron is due to a particle or to an astrophysical phenomenon. Uh, for instance, we can try to see if there are anisotropies. If you are, there is a pulsar or a few pulsar close to us producing these electron positrons in excess to the background, uh, uh, of course, on normal cosmic ray production, we do expect some level of uh, anisotropy. So we studied that. We look to this ratio as a function of the uh, um, uh, galactic uh, coordinates, uh, and we do not find any, any, any uh, anisotropy to an accuracy of the order of 3% uh, starting from 60 GV, 16 GV. It is, it is our estimate today, with increasing statistics, we are going to lower down this uh, sensitivity to anisotropy. So we don't see any dipole effect to this sensitivity. Of course, I mean, particles, uh, there is, models have to tell us which is the expected sensitivity to this, to this uh, um, variable if you use certain type of pulsar, certain type of, uh, of, uh, of efficiency in producing uh, final state in positron and electrons. We are doing measurement in many other variables. This is the proton flux measured up to about 2 TV, scaled by two, R, R, G to 2.7. This is compared to previous measurement. This is the helium flux. Please note that the helia and the protons have different slope, multiplied to the e to the 2.7. This is not what is to be expected because the acceleration of cosmic rays is expected to happen depending on rigidity, not depending on particles. Plotted in the rigidity, proton and helia are expected to have the same behavior. They don't. Not only that, but uh, there is uh, this publication by the Pamela spectrometer which was indicating a break at about 200 GV in the spectrum of both protons and helia. This was published on Science uh, in 2011. This was quite a surpri surprising feature because such a break uh, uh, is very strong. I mean, it, it really was really surprised. Um, our data do not support this kind of behavior. Uh, so there is a big discussion going on uh, who is right, who is wrong, and how, in any case, uh, this uh, does connect to data uh, which are uh, obtained at higher energy by other type of experiment. Yes? Electron spectrum and positron spectrum, uh, like that, they don't tell you very much, but uh, uh, they will are very useful in, again, going back to the interpretation of the AMS positron fraction. So we spoke about dark matter. I mentioned the pulsar. Maybe there is something else. Uh, situation is totally unclear. This is a recent publication by Cholis and Hooper, assuming 16% conversion efficiency of the energy of the pulsar in E plus, E minus pairs. If you take uh, the ratio, you can fit it pretty well. But if at the same time you take the measurement of the electron flux, not the ratio, the model which fit the ratio does not fit the uh, uh, the electron flux. This is uh, summing together all the Milky Way pulsars with some modeling, of course. So it's not obvious to take, I mean, while it's, it's e relatively easy to take pulsar to fill this ratio, at the same time, you should uh, match this flux, uh, and it's not obvious that this can be done. And similarly, by playing with different parameters, this is not something really easy to do. Since I have very little time, let me skip this few slides. And uh, let me go to the measurement of electron plus positron spectrum, which is the sum of the two spectra, of course. This is the measurement of AMS. These are the other measurement. This is uh, Fermi. We have a fairly good agreement. 
And these are the excess which was published by Attic some time ago, which was uh, indicating uh, some potential structure uh, due to new particles, at least they have been completely eliminated. And uh, this is a recent paper, again by Chulis and Hooper, which show uh, that again, uh, taking uh, the ratios uh, and uh, the, the single flux uh, uh, is difficult to have pr the same uh, fitting capability for both uh, uh, variables. While if you do more complex modeling, uh, introducing breaks in, 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 the, in, the, in the slopes, uh, there are models which can fit at the same time the two curves, uh, but are more elaborate model than the simple one which I introduced before. So the last measurement I will mention is about the boron to carbon ratio. Uh, we have a capability of measuring the, the sign of the charge and the value of the charge very precisely and uh, by repeated measurement. So we can separate and throw away events like this one where there is fragmentation. You have a, co a, a boron, car a, a carbon coming in, becoming a boron and remaining a boron. This can be thrown out by the fact that we measure precisely the charge. This is the measure of boron to carbon ratio. This is without the less significant experiments. As you can see, there is an indication of a changing of slope at about 30 GV. This is important for the models about the transport of cosmic ray to the galaxy, which in turn are important for understanding the slopes, which are in turn are important to understand the background to the positron uh, uh, plot. So by putting together all this data in a coherent fashion, you, we hope we can get uh, an explanation, a credible explanation for this ratio of positrons. So I hope I, man I managed to explain to you that uh, we understand our systematic error to about percent level. Of course, to exploit all the potential of such an experiment, you want to have a statistical accuracy matching the systematic one. And in order to accumulate statistical uh, 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 sufficiently large uh, to have a 1% statistical error at high energy, you need time. This is why we are going to collect data for several years. Uh, and uh, these uh, are the physical analysis which are nearing completion, the anti-proton up to 300 GV. Then we will attack the anti-helium. We do have a few hundred millions of helia event to look for anti-helia. Detailed analysis of ion fluxes, solar physics, gamma ray physics. Uh, this is just some of the things which are going on. So we went to the space station because we believe that the cosmos is the ultimate laboratory to study in space what is being studied at the accelerator, meaning searching for new phenomena, for new particles, for new physical behavior. And uh, on the ISS, uh, doing precision cosmic ray physics, uh, we have entered the era one century after Hess, uh, where we can use this kind of messenger uh, to test precisely fundamental properties of the matter and the field. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let's open the question first for students. Are there any? Yes, please go. Uh, why did you choose to go to the ISS instrument and not on a dedicated satellite? Okay. Um, the power and the, and the weight of such an instrument would have required a very large satellite, um, which uh, would have been very expensive. And uh, the opportunity to use the shuttle and go to the station uh, gave us uh, this possibility uh, thanks to an agreement between the OE and NASA. Uh, just to tell you, as, as things can be tricky, this, uh, this uh, uh, permanent magnet has a small dipole in units of the space station size uh, and momenta. If you go to a satellite, which, are, uh, uh, which is similar in size as the magnet itself, is not anymore true. You have to continuously correct for the interaction of the dipole moment with the magnetic field of the Earth. So you need the thousand of kilograms of hydrazine, which is this, uh, this uh, element for the stabilization rockets. Uh, just to give you an example of, of, of uh, why the space station can be useful. Then, 
the space station can guarantee 12 megabit per second average downlink, 2.5 kilowatt, which correspond to a certain number of square meter of uh, uh, silicon uh, panels, and a number of things, which would be extremely expensive to do with a standalone satellite. Uh, the, uh, the question is if there are speculation in the community why the helia and proton have a different uh, uh, slope. The, the speculation is that they, one possibility is that they could come from different acceleration locations, which is very difficult to, to explain why proton should come from a certain location and helia should come. But since uh, the, the, the law of the acceleration due to magnetic fields and, and so on are, are, are very simple and obvious and they scale with the rigidity. The only way to explain to different behavior is either at the source that you had different fields, meaning different location of the source, or there are some, uh, un, which we don't know what could be, uh, some, uh, some uh, mechanism which tend to absorb more the helia than the proton or vice versa, depending on the slope, more the proton than the helia which you are not aware of. So the, 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 the only speculation I'm aware of is uh, some different production uh, 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 location, uh, special production location, which uh, is something new, and nobody really has an explanation for that. The question is, uh, can we track down the, the source for different particles, maybe the most rare? Unfortunately, uh, not. Um, the rigidity needed to go straight through the galaxy, for example, is uh, 10 to the 16, 17, 18 GV. So on, at the extreme of this EV, sorry, at the extreme of this curve, which I, I've shown at the very beginning, particle of the other one TV, they make a circle within our solar system approximately, okay? So, so, so when we talk about uh, uh, um, sensitivity to the dipole of a pulsar, uh, and we are at the level of a percent, a few percent, uh, meaning that this is maybe the shadow or something which is very asymmetric at the origin, but the moment it go through the magnetic field uh, between this star and us, uh, get almost completely mixed. At least it get mixed more than the level of a few percent we are going to test, if you assume this hypothesis is correct. So, so there are two different problems. Fermi is a calorimeter right. and, and is, 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 is measuring the sign of electron and positron by looking to different uh, uh, the direction in the magnetic field of the Earth to use the magnetic field of the Earth to separate positive and negative, which is a very clever idea, but the systematics of that are quite tricky. So um, um, the detail of this analysis we cannot say, but obviously, they are not the instrument designed for this type of measurement. So eventually you may expect some, some, some uh, issues there. For what concern uh, instead that the competitive with Pamela, the problem is, is more serious because we are both a spectrometer. So uh, uh, the, the spectrum either is straight or is bent. There are no possibility to the extent of the statistical significance of that. So it may have to, uh, to be uh, with the treatment of the data in this high energy you know, the more you get close to the limit of your instrument in rigidity resolution, the more you are sensitive to possible systematic effect. But of course, I cannot tell exactly, but this has to be resolved. I mean, it cannot, it cannot be both. It can be... In principle, we could. There are two collaborations which are independent. The data are not yet released in the same raw data. 
So the moment they will get released, we could do that, yes. The spectral form, what, what you... Ah. Uh, so, I don't have this number for you. Uh, also because it uh, depends, is, is not, this is a, a bi-logarithmic scale, this is not uh, a single spectral law. It is, is changing with the energy and even changing uh, uh, So this is uh, clearly, you will need a, a different uh, spectral uh, 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 to, and here is also changing shape. And uh, we did not yet release the number that you're asking for, okay? We want also to acquire more statistical samples to have more precise information. For ten, for 10 years. Okay, this is an excellent question. So, um, space station w is approved uh, until 2020. We were launching in, in, in 11, so the first uh, statement that we are going to take data until the space station 2020 will operation, operationally uh, functioning. Uh, we, don't, uh, we, we are monitoring uh, the behavior of all the instrumentation and so far we do not have any indication of either consumables which are consuming faster than expected, in particular the transition radiation detector uses gas and there is a slow loss of this gas, it is recirculated and uh, the last uh, evaluation of the res uh, reserve was about 27 years. So this is not an issue from the point of view of consumable. Everything else is not a consumable, it's electronics and uh, we do not have any decay in terms of channels which are dying or things like that. So from what we are concerned so far, we do not have indication of uh, aging of the detector. Uh, what about uh, the, the resources? Uh, clearly, if we are in a, con I mean, as everybody else, we are in a continuous uh, uh, discussion with the agencies which support the teams uh, in order to have uh, uh, operational, operation extended as much as possible. At this moment, we have three years for operation until uh, review will take place again. So I think we are going to operate until 2016, at least. Uh, let me also add, uh, in the space station, once we fin uh, on the space station, AMS cannot be removed, it cannot be returned. So you can decide to switch off but nothing more than that. <laughs> it looks a little bit silly to do that uh, if you don't have a very good reason for doing that. Final question. Um, I, maybe naive, but at, at very high energy, I would expect that it doesn't matter whether it's a positron or an electron. So is there any physical, physical reason why this positron to electron uh, ratio always is much less than one? Um, so, the, 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 the slow, so first of all, electrons and positrons when they are accelerator, accelerated in various places of the galaxy, they quickly lose energy because of brain strahlung. Mm -hmm. So they cannot go far away from the acceleration uh, uh, location. 10 kiloparsec, 8 kiloparsec, this kind of, of di distance is very little. Second, this, uh, without taking uh, in account uh, um, exotic sources as we are considering, but this slow going down is because basically the positrons do annihilate and the electrons do not. To, to, to go to the very bottom of the, of the question. Okay, so um, I guess we thank Professor again for his nice talk. <laughs>